All right, so continuing on in our unit about triangles is going to be section 5.3. Okay, so in 5.2, we talked about if I have two triangles that are congruent, I've already determined them to be congruent, then they have corresponding parts that I can line up with one another. Okay, so we've already talked about those two ideas. So now let's talk about, well, how do I determine if two triangles can be congruent? Okay, what are, are there special tools or there special tests that two triangles have got to pass? And there are indeed. Okay, and that's what we're going to talk about in this section. There are certain tests that two triangles will have to pass in order for them to be considered congruent. Okay, so before we get into that, we need to identify some things that can help us in determining triangles being congruent. Okay, so these are going to be uh, some common things that could occur in triangles that could uh, give us evidence and give us more proof that they can be congruent. Okay. So that's why we said before, labeling is going to be so very, very important. Um, the order that you do label these triangles in, making sure the corresponding parts do indeed line up. Okay, so let's talk first about this example, okay? So if two triangles have got what is known as a reflexive side, then that means they've got some pair of corresponding parts, some pair of congruent parts, okay? So in this image right here, okay? Now, depending on if you're looking at the line in the middle, this could be one big triangle, triangle PQS, or it could be two smaller triangles, triangle PRS and PRQ. So in this example, I have got two triangles that share a side, okay? Both triangles, if I was to pull these triangles apart, the triangle on the left would have a side PR, the triangle on the right would have a side PR. So anytime two triangles share a side, that side is known as a reflexive side. And if two triangles have a reflexive side, then they for sure, without a doubt, have a pair of congruent sides, okay? So if I was to write this out, I would say that side PR is congruent to side PR, which you would think that makes kind of common sense. But what I'm really saying is that the PR on the left is congruent to the PR on the right. So both of these triangles have a segment PR as one of the sides. So that's why it's known as a reflexive side. Same thing in this triangle. <clears throat> okay. So this time I've got what looks like a four-sided figure. But there's a diagonal that's been drawn that is cutting it into two triangles. Okay. So I've got triangles HEF and triangle FGH. And in the middle, this diagonal right here is a side that they both share. This is segment HF. So I could say that segment HF is congruent to segment HF, and that's a reflexive side. Okay, so if two triangles have got a reflexive side, then they for sure have got a pair of corresponding parts. Let's keep going. Okay, so this next one, vertical angles. If two triangles have a set of vertical angles, then they've got a set of corresponding parts. Remember, we talked about vertical angles being two angles that are non-adjacent. Okay, they're not right next to each other. They don't share a side. But they are created from intersecting lines, and they are going to be equal to one another. So let's look at this example. We've got right here. Okay, so these two triangles right here, they are joined at one of their vertexes. And as you see, these angles are created by these two lines, WZ and VY. And so the angles that result from the intersection of these lines are vertical angles. So we could say angle WXV and angle YXZ are congruent to one another, okay? Now, granted, you could say angle WXV and angle ZXY, but the reason why we don't want to do that, why we're going to get a little bit farther into why we don't want to do that is because now we want to make sure we are lining up our corresponding parts. So while this angle right here, we could say angle YXZ or angle ZXY, and we wouldn't be wrong now we want to make sure that we are lining up the corresponding parts correctly. So if I go angle WXV, where the marked angle is the last one in this example, then over here I want to go in the order of angle YXZ, where again the marked angle will be the last one. Okay, And that's really kind of a nitpicky thing, but it is something that we do want to be careful about because it may be not necessarily as big deal here, but when we have two triangles later on that may be oriented different, they're turned a different way, we want to make sure that we are labeling everything in the correct order. Okay, so let's look at this example. Okay, so again, got two angles that are right here across from each other at that vertex. Okay, 
They're created from the intersections of lines DA and CB. Okay, so they're both created from that intersection. So these two angles must be vertical angles. So now, how do we name these angles? Okay, so if I name the first one, angle DEB, then there's only one correct way that I can name the second one to get it in the right order, and that's angle AEC. Okay, notice, angle DEB. Okay, so the first segment, because again, any angle is created from two segments, the first segment has got one tick mark, the second has got two tick marks. So angle DEB. If I want to name my other angle in the correct order, then I got to go first with the side that has one tick mark, angle AE or side AE, and then the one with two tick marks, EC. So then my second angle would be angle AEC. Again, naming it angle CEA is not wrong, but we want to get it in the right order now. Okay, so that's why we're going to name it angle AEC, just so we can be accurate with our label. Okay, let's look at two more things that can help us to determine if two triangles are congruent. Okay, so if two triangles share or have a midpoint between them. Okay, so in the example right here, I've got two triangles that again are kind of connected right here. Okay, so we are told E is the midpoint of KW. Well, KW is this whole segment, okay? So KW is a segment that is shared by both triangles, okay? So if E is the midpoint of KW, if you recall from unit one, a midpoint is the point that is exactly in the middle of a segment, and it cuts that segment into pieces. So at point E, we're cutting KW into two pieces. So if I've got two pieces that are equal, they're congruent, I can put these tick marks on the pieces. So then I can say that, Segment KE is congruent to segment EW, which also means that I've got a set of corresponding parts in these two triangles, okay? Which is one step closer to me determining if these two triangles are indeed congruent, okay? Second example, D is the midpoint of MT, okay? So this picture looks a little bit different uh, just because instead of it looking like the triangles are flipped over each other like a mirror, it looks like this one just kind of got shifted over a little bit. But still, this statement still holds D right here is the midpoint of MT, meaning that point D cuts MT in half. And those two halves are going to be MD and DT. And notice this time I kind of, I changed up the wording just a little bit, or I changed up the labeling just a little bit, okay? So the reason why we said MD and DT, and the reason why point D is not in the same position in both of these. Well, if you look in my left triangle, point D is the right corner. In my left triangle, D is the left corner. So if I'm matching up my corresponding parts, M in my left triangle has to match up to D in my right triangle. And then D in my left triangle has to match up to T in my right triangle. So that's why I didn't do MD and TD because that would technically be incorrect. I wanted to make sure I matched up the corresponding parts. So it had to be MD is congruent to DT. Okay, let's look at this last feature. So I've got an angle bisector. So angle bisector, again, back from unit one, an angle bisector is just going to be a line, a ray, a segment that cuts an angle in half, whether that angle is in some kind of a polygon or just an angle by itself, an angle bisector can still apply. So right here, I'm told that AD is the bisector of angle BAC. So ray AD is right here. Angle BAC is right here. So an angle bisector is going to cut an angle directly in half. So that means angle BAC right here is getting cut in half. So that's why I put these little tick marks here to symbolize that those two half angles are indeed congruent. So now the question is, how do I label them? Well, if I label this first half angle, angle BAD, okay, so I went out, up, down, then my second angle is going to be named in the same fashion, angle CAD. And those two angles will be congruent to one another. Okay, let's look at this example. DC bisects angle ACB. So DC, that is this segment right here in the middle of the triangle. Angle ABACB, excuse me, is this top angle right here. Okay, so if it says DC bisects it, that means we're cutting it in half. 
So I just went ahead and labeled these two with one tick mark. And so we could name these things angles A, C, D, and angles B, C, D. Be completely correct. A, C, D, and B, C, D. Or if we want to take the shortcut, we can just say angle one is congruent to angle two. Okay, so if any triangles have got one of these four features here, a reflexive side, vertical angles, midpoint, or angle bisector, then we are one step closer to determining if these two triangles are congruent.